What are human beings? Where have we come from? What is the world made of? What are the forces that control the universe? I'm Adam Hart Davis, and I'm about to explore those big questions. Questions that people have been trying to solve for 2,000 years. And in wrestling with those questions, scientists have completely changed the way we think and the way we live. I find it almost impossible to imagine a world without electricity. No computers, no television, no mobile phones. The mysteries of electricity were first unravelled in this very lab 150 years ago by a young man who never even went to school, but had an extraordinary combination of brains, determination and luck. Most of all, he had the skill to ask the right questions and then put in the hard work to find out the answers. Without Michael Faraday, we might all still be living in the dark. Michael Faraday was born in 1791, at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Steam-powered machines were starting to appear all over Britain. Advances in technology were completely transforming the way that people lived. Locomotives like this were being developed in the very early 1800s, a high-pressure steam engine on wheels. It may look old-fashioned, but if you were used to a horse and cart, this was super high technology. Everyone was looking for new forms of power. It was the world in which Michael Faraday grew up, a world of hissing and puffing changes. What a wonderful machine. Michael Faraday's father was a blacksmith. He worked hard, but working-class people had little opportunity to get on in the world. The young Faraday never even went to school. But this didn't stop him from wanting to learn. He took a job as a bookbinder's assistant. It was boring work, but it did allow him to read hundreds of books. He had a great passion for science, or natural philosophy, as it was called in those days. Michael Faraday educated himself by copying out passages in books which caught his interest. And if you were interested in natural philosophy, there was one place you had to go. The Royal Institution in London was the hangout for anyone who wanted to know what was happening in scientific research. There, upper-class gentlemen would gather and discuss the latest ideas and discoveries. It would be a difficult world for the son of a blacksmith to enter. Faraday seized his chance when one of his employer's customers gave him tickets to some lectures at the Royal Institution given by Sir Humphrey Davy. Sir Humphrey was a glamorous society figure, a brilliant scientist and a spellbinding speaker. The talks took place in the lecture theatre at the Royal Institution. According to legend, Faraday sat right here, just above the clock, and he listened absolutely enthralled to Davy's lectures. More than anything else, he wanted to leave the boring world of bookbinding and join the new exciting world of natural philosophy. <laughs> Sir Humphrey was a pioneering chemist and delighted his audience with spectacular demonstrations. <laughs> Faraday was so impressed that he wrote detailed notes of those four lectures and bound them. After all, he was a bookbinder. And this is it. This is the bound copy that he sent to Davy. Here we are, four lectures being part of a course on the elements of chemical philosophy delivered by Sir H. Davy. And he said, dear Sir Humphrey, could I have a job? Unfortunately, there wasn't a job going at the time, but then fate lent a hand. 
During one of his experiments, Sir Humphrey was injured in an explosion and temporarily blinded. It was bad news for Sir Humphrey, but a big break for Michael Faraday. Davy hired him as an assistant and he opened the door into the brand new world of science. At first, Faraday was just a bottle washer for Sir Humphrey, but soon he was doing his own experiments with electricity. Electricity was a mystery. Very little was known about it at the time. In America, Benjamin Franklin had tried to study lightning by flying a kite into a thunderstorm. Scientists tried to figure out how electric eels created shocks. In 1780, Luigi Galvani in Italy experimented with animal electricity by connecting frogs' legs to copper and zinc wires. It wasn't as crazy as it may seem. This strange recipe of copper, zinc and a damp, salty frog would provide the foundation for a revolutionary new invention. In 1799, an Italian scientist called Alessandro Volta made an astonishing discovery, which was that if you took two different metals, like copper and zinc, and you put them together, actually touched them together, you could make a small amount of electricity. And that was a sensation, because it meant you could build up what was called a voltaic pile. Here is one. This is one of Faraday's voltaic piles. And you see we've got copper zinc, copper zinc, copper zinc, copper zinc, 25 pairs of plates, which would have been separated by salt solution or dilute acid. And then you've got 25 or 30 volts harnessed electricity in a box, portable. You might not want this in your mini disc player, but nevertheless, they could use it. It was a sensation and it started an entire new science around the world. Scientific journals had begun to appear as a way of sharing information about new discoveries. These journals allowed ideas to spread quickly and led to a rapid growth in scientific knowledge and experimentation. It was in one such journal that in 1819 Faraday read about the work of a Danish scientist called Ørsted. Working in his lab in Copenhagen, Ørsted was one of the first to explore electricity and magnetism. In his most famous experiment, he placed a copper wire close to the needle of a magnetic compass. When an electric current was passed down the wire, the compass needle deflected. Ørsted's experiment showed that electricity and magnetism might be able to produce motion. Faraday was fascinated by these results of Ørsted's and he was very keen to find out the connection between electricity and magnetism. So here in this very room he set up an experiment and I've got a recreation of it here. Powered with his voltaic pile he made a little pool of mercury round a magnet in the centre there and then he put a voltage between that mercury and this brass stand here and he hung a wire. This is just a copper wire which is going to hang from there in the pool of mercury beside the magnet. And just see what happens. Hang it in, complete the circuit, and it goes round and round and round. So in this very room on the 4th of September 1821, Michael Faraday invented the world's first ever electric motor. With a piece of copper wire dipped into a pool of mercury, Faraday made motion by combining electricity and magnetism. And they still use the same principle today. In this Eurostar train, which is actually setting off as I speak, going to Disneyland Paris, they've got a combination of electricity and magnetism making fantastic motion, zooming across the French countryside. I just wish I was going with it. The train has 12 motors. Each creates a powerful magnetic field which makes the moving parts rotate, propelling the train along at 300 kilometers an hour. But back in 1821, Faraday was still struggling to understand the mysterious forces which can produce such enormous power. Faraday didn't just use magnets. He was really fascinated by them and he longed to find out what was going on in there. 
here's a magnet, and if you stick some bits of old iron on it, or steel I expect this is, you might be forgiven for thinking that magnetism happens in straight lines. Here we have more or less a straight line of magnetic force. But Faraday didn't see it like that at all. He looked at this magnet and he knew there were two poles, one at each end, and he could visualise in his head these lines coming out and joining the poles. He could see it in three dimensions. He called them lines of force, which is a term still used today. And he devised this beautiful demonstration to show these at least in two dimensions. So I've put my magnet under this card and here I have some iron filings and I'm just going to scatter these on top like this. And there you can see the shape of the magnet coming through. That's the rectangle. And when we've got a little bit more in the way of arm filings, I'll just tap the card and get them all moving a bit. And now you can see those lines of force, just as Faraday could see them in his head, coming out from this pole here, but then they're coming round from one pole to the other in tight loops through space. Armed with this understanding of magnetic forces, he directed his energy to a new set of experiments. He knew you could use electricity and magnetism to create motion. Did this also mean you could use magnetism and motion to create electricity? On August the 29th, 1831, Faraday would discover the answer in an experiment that would change the world. With his induction ring, he discovered that moving a magnet could actually create electricity. You can see the principle at work here. The movement of the magnet in between the two coils produces enough electricity to power a light bulb. This combination of motion and magnetism can also produce electricity on a large scale. This turbine works on exactly the same principle as Faraday's lab experiment. It's powered by the wind instead of by hand, and that one rotor generates enough electricity for 3,000 people. There are more than 80 electromagnets up there attached to the hub of the turbine. It looks wonderful from the ground, this building, but I gather it's 65 metres up there and 300 steps, and I'm not terribly fond of heights. five steps. This thing generates a megawatt, even a megawatt and a half. Why can't they use some of that electricity to run a lift? Now, I'm not going to look down, but over there is Swaffham, and this generator makes enough electricity to supply half of Swaffham. It is amazing. What's rather extraordinary and delightful is that although Faraday made the first generator, he wasn't interested in practical applications, and the first if you like, real generator, was made by a Frenchman called Hippolyte Pixie. What Faraday wanted was to understand the physical principles and demonstrate them to the world. The world has Faraday to thank for harnessing the awesome powers of electricity. The principles of his work lie at the heart of how power is produced and supplied to our homes. But electricity on this scale can also be deadly. These men are repairing live electric lines for the national grid. They have to be suspended in the air to prevent the electricity passing through them to the ground. Working with up to 400,000 volts, it's a potentially deadly situation. But the suits they're wearing are made of metal. It seems illogical, but it's based on a principle Faraday discovered over 150 years ago. This machine is generating an enormously high voltage. You see those sparks? That's about a quarter of a million volts. I can feel the hairs on my arms standing on end. Now, we're going to connect that machine to this wire cage. It's all made of chicken wire. What Faraday said was that there is no charge inside a hollow conductor. Well, this is certainly a hollow conductor. It's all made of metal. 
And if he's right, I can stay in here with a quarter of a million votes on it and I'll be fine. And if he's wrong, I'm going to die. OK, connect up the machine. Well, I can't feel anything yet. I'm still alive, definitely. But the machine is charging up. Now, if I touch it... That's all right. I don't feel anything. I'm not electrocuted by the chicken wire. I don't get a shock because there are no differences in potential or voltage inside the hollow conductor. This kind of conductor is now called a Faraday cage. It seems very odd wearing a metal suit to be charged up to half a million volts, but this is what they do here at the National Grid. They're actually training people to go and work on those overhead wires. And the point is that all these wires are copper wires coated with silver. And so the whole suit is, in fact, a Faraday cage. And the idea is that inside it, I shouldn't suffer. Well, I hope I won't. I'm going to try it in a minute. Right, now I'm safe. What about my nose? It's not protected. You are shielded by the peak of the hat. This is enough, is it? Are you yes. sure? Should be. I hope they know what they're doing. And finally your head. Oh, so am I OK? Yes. So there's no reason not to go then? No, nope, you're attached. You've got continuity of your suit. You're ready to go. OK, Chris, can you take her away, please? I've done lots of unpleasant and dangerous things in the interest of science. This is about as scary as they come. Ah. Ah. I think I'll shut my eyes. OK, beam me in, Chris. Now, in my domestic electricity at home, I've got 240 volts. That, they say, is 400,000 volts. It's quite scary. They say, hold out my hand first. I can't feel a thing. Still can't feel anything. Ah, I can feel a tingling. Ah! Wow! <laughs> I'm hanging on to nearly half a million volts. That is amazing. Oh. Well, it looks as though this Faraday suit has saved my life. It, it really felt like it with all those 400,000 volts. I'm delighted that it still works. Well, of course, I believe in the physics. And I have to say, I take my hat off to Michael Faraday, the young lad who had the, the courage and the, the vision to understand electricity. <laughs> Done, if you would. Done.